Hello? Hi. Is this okay? Can you hear me? Mm. Yeah, hi, I'm Camille. <clears throat> Welcome to my talk about proof of concept uh, implementing evil maid attack on encrypted boot. The talk has basically three main parts. The first one is understanding uh, the basic boot process and it's about some uh, grub internals. Then we will look at exploiting evil maid attack on an unencrypted boot, uh, boot partition and we will see that it's very easy. And then we will switch to an encrypted boot partition and we see uh, what changes and uh, why it's not that easy to exploit it. <clears throat> what is this talk about and what not? Um, it's about Linux booting uh, from BIOS MBR. Um, I'm using GRUB 204 and looks as encryption. I have a test VM running Debian Bullseye <clears throat> and this is not about any other operating system, GPT or UEFI. So let's start with the definition. Uh, an evil made attack is an attack on an unintended device in which an attacker with physical access alerts it in some undetectable way so that they can later access the device or the data on it. <clears throat> Uh, that, for example, you stay here in Karlsruhe and during the day you're here, but you leave your laptop in the hotel and someone has access, uh, access to the laptop and can modify some data on the uh, laptop. And this is the scenario you're speaking here. <clears throat> the technical problem is um, that the code that asks you during boot for the root password, uh, for the full disk encryption password, it's not encrypted and it's not signed. So an attacker can just modify this code and can get the password. The motivation for this project and this talk was that I couldn't find a proof of concept for an evil made attack on encrypted boot partition, so I was motivated to write one. And I'm really fascinated about Linux and learning basic stuff like what happens during boot. <clears throat> and we will start by uh, understanding the boot process. Uh, from a high level perspective, uh, the BIOS loads the bootloader, uh, which is GRUB in our case. GRUB, as the bootloader, has the, the task and the goal to, uh, to run the operating system. So it first loads and executes the kernel and the initRD. initRD is a, a temporary root file system. initRD roots the, uh, mounts the root file system and executes the init system, like, like systemd. And the init system starts services like SSH. <clears throat> um, yes, as I said, Grub has the main goal to run the operating system. Uh, it has to handle limited space and therefore it runs in multiple uh, stages. And as there are many different cases how a system can look like, uh, it uses modules and builds everything together with the modules uh, to successfully boot a system. So <clears throat> the first sector of the hard drive is a master boot record. It contains stage one of GRUB. So GRUB has three stages, stage one, stage 1.5, and stage two. The first 446 bytes are stage one of GRUB. Then there are four partition table entries. And at the end, there's a magic number. As there is not that much space, the only task or goal of boot image or stage one is to load the next stage, which is stage 1.5 or called core image. Um, <clears throat> core image is stored at sector one, so it's just one sector after the master boot record, which is in many cases the space before the first partition. Stage two is basically everything in slash boot. 
So the task of core image is to get access to slash boot. And there are many cases how a system can look like. In the simplest case, you just need to read data from the disk. So you need to speak to the disk, <coughs> speak with the disk and understand the file system. So then you can mount slash boot. <coughs> but there are other uh, special cases like uh, booting from network, PXE, uh, using other disks or LVM, or in our case later, we are uh, using full disk encryption for slash boot. So we need to decrypt the disk at this point and we need to speak with a keyboard and there's a keyboard layout. So there are many things that can be uh, <clears throat> part of core image. And yeah, to sum up, it's the goal is to get slash boot. <clears throat> then in stage two, uh, there's a central configuration file, grub.config. We will see that later. It contains uh, um, the Linux kernel and the initrd. <clears throat> it loads the kernel into the memory, it extracts itself, so the kernel is running. Then the initrd is extracted and mounted, and there are tools and scripts that first mount the file system. <clears throat> Therefore, it needs to decrypt the disk, and then it starts the init system. We can uh, take a look at how this works on Linux, or how it looks like. I have a test VM. <clears throat> so, if you want to use grub as bootloader, you basically use grub install and use the the disk you have. This is how you just install it. It's a very common and well-known command. And it's followed by an update grub, which generates the grub configuration file. I just want to show you the disk layout. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than it needs to be, but there's basically one disk, VDA, with a five gigabyte, gigabyte of size. And the partition VDA5 is a Lux container containing LVM volumes, and there is the root file system here. As you can see, there's no mount point for slash boot, so boot is part of slash and it's also encrypted. <clears throat> we can take a look at the master boot record using DD. So we say in, uh, input file is def VDA, block size is 512, count one. And we remove uh, this. Oh yes, we need it. <laughs> Hex dump. Yes. So we see uh, the magic bytes at the end, 55AA. Right in front of it, there's uh, the space for the boot, uh, for the partition table. And everything before is just stage one of grab which is assembler code that is loaded into memory and executed. And the task is to load the next part. There's a file on your system called boot image. It's placed in user lib something something, and it's part of a, a package. Uh, it's part of grub PC bin. And if you look at it, you will find out that it's very similar to your master boot record. And this is very typical for grub, which uses template files and it modifies some bytes and then writes it to disk. <clears throat> One cool thing is that you can run grub install with minus V and you get verbose output. I will redirect it to in file. <clears throat> As you can see, there's a lot of things happening here. 
And if we grab this output for core image, now we can see that grub install calls a tool called grub make image. And this one creates a file, uh, namely our core image. Um, this is the output. So it's in slash boot. This is where core image is stored. And later it's written to disk. So grub install enumerates the system, uh, what is needed to boot the system. And you can see here, these are all modules which are required. So X2, LVM, crypto stuff. Um, <clears throat> and then we have a core image, which is then stored at disk. So this was, oops. This was stage one and stage 1.5. Let's look at uh, stage two, so everything in slash boot. There's a config file in boot grub, which is uh, grub.config. This is the central config file. Um, if you call update grub, then it's basically a wrapper. It's calling grub make config and outputs the grub file, the grub config file. What it basically does, it, it goes to uh, etc grub d, and there are some bash scripts. Um, if you try to execute them, uh, you can't by hand because you need to source some files before. And this is basically what this. Uh, uh, grub make config does, it source some files. It's uh, for example, the well-known etc default grub. It just gets sourced. Um, and then for example, here you can specify kernel parameters you want to have. And uh, if you check out the, the grub config file, you will see that here, begin grub d00 header. So it's basically the bash scripts print stuff and everything concatenated builds your grub configuration. <clears throat> this is what it looks like in the grub configuration file. Uh, later it looks, oops, like this one. It's not that sharp but um, <clears throat> you basically can change this configuration and edit. For example, add a kernel parameter uh, init bin bash. This line, for example, ins mod, this, every, every line here is a command at this stage of, during boot, and it loads a module. For example, in slash boot, and you can look for crypto disk and you will find that there's a module with this name. And later you see a crypt mount command. And then also in slash boot grub, there is a file command uh, somewhere. <clears throat> Mm, oh, it's here. And it shows you that the crypto mount command is part of the crypto disk module. And there's two, there are two echo commands. Uh, you can see them during boot. This specifies uh, the Linux kernel and parameters. So this is basically what you can specify in the etc default grub. And this is where the init root system lays. Yes, so basically what happens here is the kernel is loaded into memory, extract itself, then we have the kernel running, 
then initrd is loaded into memory, extracted, and then um, yes, it mounts the disk. In case of encryption, it needs to decrypt the disk first and then runs the init system. We will see that later. <clears throat> Just need to... Okay, so now as we got some basics, uh, let's talk about evil mate attack on unencrypted boot partition. The first question is, um, where does the decryption takes place? Um, in this case, it takes place in slash boot. To be con con uh, to specify, it, it's part of the init RD. Uh, there is a crypt setup binary, which is called. I can show it to you. <clears throat> so we can go to init RD. Mm, it's gzip, so we can set cat it, and it's in CPIO archive, and we need this one, IDMV. And now we can extract the init RD. There's this init file, which is called, which is basically a bash script and at the end of the bash script there's something called run init and this is the part where it calls your init system which is normally sbin init and it knows at this point the the mount point of the root file system where all your data lies <clears throat> in the script there are or, there are other scripts that are called they are placed in the scripts folder and somewhere here, there is uh, the, the, the crypt setup binary is called from there. So there is the crypt setup binary somewhere here. Yes, so we extracted the init RD. We can now modify some files, rebuild it. And that's our attack scenario. You can patch the crypt setup binary to dump the password the user enters, or you can use one of the bash scripts uh, to ask the user for the password. If you just do, um, yes, print and ask the user for the password, and then you can add a looks uh, at another key slot. <clears throat> yeah, so basically that's it. As a conclusion, uh, exploiting this is very easy because you just have to modify a bash script. And there are um, GitHub repositories and you can just use them and exploiting is very easy. <clears throat> so let's move on and let's pretend the boot partition is encrypted. What changes? So now you can just patch the init RD because it's encrypted and you don't have the password. But the problem still remains, which means the decryption code is still unencrypted and you can modify it as an attacker, uh, but it's harder to implement. And as I couldn't find some information on the internet, my idea was to, hey, let's build an exploit, try this. <clears throat> So, again, the same question, where does the decryption takes place? As slash boot is encrypted, it needs to be somewhere before, and boot image has only about 400 bytes, so that's not enough. So, <clears throat> it's somewhere in the core image. So, I needed to look at core image, and as I've said, core image is generated by the grub make image, executable and this is called by the grub install. So I just checked out the code and read the code, tried to understand the code. This is the high level structure of core image. It's a concatenation of disk boot image, LZMA decompress image and compressed stuff. The disk boot image is basically just for bootstrapping to load the rest of core image. LZMA decompress 
is the code to decompress data that is compressed with LZMA. The compressed stuff is a kernel image. This is not the Linux kernel. You have to keep in mind that at this point during boot, you don't have the Linux kernel running and you don't have a file system. So there's basic functionality that you need to implement. And this is part of, uh, this is the task of kernel image. Uh, then there's a struct, grab module info, which holds just information about how many modules are part of core image. And the modules have, uh, each one has a type, a size, and the actual content. For example, a module, most modules are ELF binaries, <clears throat> so the kernel also needs an ELF parser. <clears throat> Sorry. Yes. How can we exploit it? Sorry, I need to drink something. <clears throat> We <coughs> can extract core image because it's not encrypted. We can analyze it. I tell you in a moment why that this is important. Then we can uh, patch the Lux module. It's the it's, uh, this is where the decryption takes place. I needed to add disk mod as a dependency uh, to the core image, uh, because otherwise I couldn't write to disk. Then I can rebuild core image, write it to disk, and during next boot, my code get, gets executed, I can dump the password. Oh. Okay. So the output of grub install shows us how the core image is built. We can call it directly. And we can see that it's using the kernel image, else may decompress, the disk boot image. And this is basically the list of the modules that are included. This is the looks module that I want to patch. And the output file is this. So it's 54 kilobytes. Now from an attacker point of view, I have access to the disk. I can plug it to my PC. I have it in this case here as a file. And the first thing I can do is I can extract core image because I know where it is. It's in the first sector and I know the length. It's part of the core image. So I have here the image. It's a little bit bigger. <clears throat> okay, then I wrote an analyzer so I can analyze the core image. So we can now see all the modules and have all parts that is included into core image. As you can see, a type zero means ELF binary. There's a size. Um, there are other types uh, which holds configuration or identifier. And at this point, I know that there are binary uh, that are modules and there are ELF files, but I don't know which one is the Lux module. So what I do is I calculate the MD5 hash sum and I have an a folder with uh, mods Debian 11, which stores all modules. They are public because they're part of the Debian system packages. And so I can find uh, which module is actually which module. So Lux, Lux module is uh, this one. So the next steps are patching the Lux module, um, rebuilding core image and deplo deploying it to the disk. I had the problem 
cross compile it from Arch and it didn't work. So I rebuilt Lux module on my Debian system. Uh, grub. There's a file in grub core disk lux.c. So if you just build the whole thing, this file gives you the lux module. And my patch is basically <clears throat> I wait for the user to enter the password, then I check or I wait uh, until the check succeeds. So it's the valid password. And my backdoor is a debug print. Thanks for your password. I'm writing it to the disk. <laughs> I open the first disk. And then I write the passphrase to the first disk at sector 2023, just because uh, it was zeroed out in my case. <clears throat> I tried this and it didn't work. And if you have, um, yeah, you don't have any debug output or logging or something, so it just doesn't work. And it makes sense that it doesn't work because grub disk write weak is just not existent because normally you don't need to write your disk during boot. And that's why I needed to add the disk module as part of the module list. And then it worked. So I can compile it, then I have my modified Lux module. I can put it to the attacker machine. Then I have a script to backdoor the core image. And there are two important things, as I just said. Here, <clears throat> loading the disk module and edit it as first module. And I replaced the Lux module with my malicious one. And this gives me a new generated core image. I can analyze it. And as you can see, the first module is now the disk module. And there's not the default Lux module. Instead, there's the Lux backdoor working building on mod, uh, Debian back, uh, module. <clears throat> All right, and then we need to deploy to the disk. So I have here a simple bash script, which first makes a backup of the master boot record. Then I zero out everything until the first partition starts, which is uh, sector 2048. I restore the MBR. And then I flush my core image um, right after the master boot record. So block size 512 and seek one block. <clears throat> we can do this, but maybe we just stop the VM before. And I have also a script or, yeah. That just dumps me sector 2023 and it's empty right now. Now we can deploy the core image. And if we boot again, I can enter my password 123 and then you can see, thanks for your password 123, writing it to disk. And it's booting normally. <clears throat> and now I get the password. One, two, three. <clears throat> yes. So how can we fix it? You can store grub on an external USB drive. So the the master boot record and the core image. Or you can move to UEFI and use it with secure boot. It's not that hard to implement it. If you're interested, you can just check out this repository. There are some tools and it's very easy to deploy. 
And another learning that I had is if your system fails to boot, just rebuild the broken stage. <laughs> so if you, you've seen it or you know it, if you boot your system, there are a lot of debug messages or in general, there are a lot of messages. And as an exercise, try to map which message belongs to which component. So you have the, the BIOS, three stages of grub, there's the kernel, initRD, uh, the init system, and try to match each line of output to the, to the component. So who logs which message? And if something fails, just rebuild the stage. So for example, reflash your BIOS, uh, reinstall the, the, the kernel package or re, uh, rerun grub install in a change root environment. And that's basically it. Uh, I will publish the code and the slides on GitHub the next days. And now I'm happy to give some Q&A. Wow. Well. Thank you very much, Camilla, for showing us how the Linux boot works and how you modified it. So anybody who has questions, please raise your hand I will, and I will come and you can speak them into the microphone. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to add to your list of fixes that there is an, uh, from Joanna Rutkowska, the, one of the uh, devs of CubesOS, there is an anti-evil maid system that works on pretty much all Linux, that works with the TPM to verify every code that is uh, run. Any more questions? So, there was one, where? Hmm. Hmm. Don't know. I can see, there's another one. I've got installed um, <laughs> Linux with Setupite file system on boot. And I've tried to install group to the boot section and um, had the problem that um, the parameter denote size isn't recognized by group. And um, th this resulted to an unknown file system error. <laughs> Do you know what's the issue for this? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Are there any more questions? I can't see any, so if there are no questions anymore, thank you very much, Camille. A round of applause, please.